Do you have a Bible this morning with you, church? Anybody? Are you, are you awake today, church? Come on now. Uh, if you have a Bible, you can open up to Matthew chapter 20. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's all right. We will have it on the screens for you today. My name is Landon, and uh, I say this all the time, but it is such an honor and a privilege to be able to stand up here this morning and, and just to preach the Word of God. We never take it lightly here at Crosswalk, the opportunity just to be able to communicate God's Word. And so I'm just praying this today that it would speak to you, that God would speak to you. And if you're taking notes this morning, any note takers? Yeah. Come on now, okay, okay. If you're taking notes, you can title this message this morning. It's called Grasping at Greatness. Grasping at Greatness. And Jesus talks with his disciples, verse 20 of Matthew 20, Matthew 20, 20. Jesus says this, or it starts out by saying this, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons kneeling down. She asked a favor of him. What is it that you want? Jesus asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what it is that you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. I like how Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. And then they continued to be confident in what they're asking. That's great. I love it. Jesus said to them, verse 23, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, the other ten disciples, when they heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them all together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must become great your servant. And whoever wants to be first must become your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And give his life a ransom for many. Oh, I love this passage. Grasping at greatness. Would you pray with me this morning, church? Do you like your sit next to today at church? Good. Praise God. Lord Jesus, Thank you for being here today. Thank you for the power, for your power in this room. Thank you for the power of your name as we sang in that song. The power of the name of Jesus. It brings victory. It has defeated death, hell, and the grave. And so Jesus, we just proclaim that power in this room today. God, have your way in this place. Do what only you can do. Let us walk out of this room changed. Not because of my words, because of your power. The power of the name of Jesus. We pray for chains to be broken this morning. We pray for addictions to be broken. We pray for bondage to be lifted. God, we pray that you would have your way. In Jesus' name, everybody said together, amen, amen, amen. amen. Church, have you, ever, um, have you ever known someone that knew how to manipulate a situation? Anybody here? You're kind of, you're thinking about this. I can just see the faces right now. You've, you've ever known someone who could manipulate a situation? I grew up in a large family, uh, larger than most. Uh, I have nine siblings. My parents had ten children. If you're uh, familiar with our church, then you probably know that already. But if you're new, I'm just letting you know a little insight. Give some context to this story. Growing up, it was always a little bit of a challenge when we traveled, but we loved to travel. So we, we would never fly anywhere. We drove everywhere. I was telling a friend of mine this week that every other year we would drive to Canada one year. Then the other years we'd drive to Texas. We would do these long road trips. And then we had family in Colorado for a short period of time. So we would drive to Colorado, which was like 27 hours. Okay. So we loved road trips. And you can just imagine for a moment uh, just the, the, the uh, nuances to 
traveling a road trip with 12 you know, people in, in one vehicle. I, I have a picture back there if you guys have it. This was, I don't know when this was. This is probably 10 or 12 years ago. That's my family. That was the Moro Mobile, okay? That, that van went all over the world, okay, on these road trips. As you can see, we had our, our luggage and our everything. We had a whole setup. But it was a, it was a challenge in some ways, to navigate driving these long distances, okay? Back early on, my dad was the only driver, so it was like, you know, and let me just say this, the seating arrangement mattered. If you've got kids and you've taken a road trip, the seating arrangement matters, okay? Now you got different seats. Different seats have different access to different things. You got the window seats. You got you know the seats that has the good ventilation of the air conditioning. You, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you've you've got the seats that are closest to the food supply. How many of you know those? That food on a road trip is important. Okay, and you you've got the seats that are next to the uh, how should I say the challenging siblings to be sitting next to. And in our family, we always had babies in the car. So you, then you got the seat next to the car seats, which had its challenges, the screaming babies going on. And then, then, you, had, then you had the back seat with no leg room and just, it's just all these challenges. I remember every year, about a week before we would go on these road trips, some of you guys are just, I can just see your faces just imagining these dynamics. It's just, it's so good. Uh, I had one sibling, and, and I won't tell you who, uh, she would always uh, kind of have this back room conversation with my parents about a week before to try to negotiate or, in other words, manipulate the seating arrangement. She didn't think that any other siblings would catch wind. You know what I'm saying? No, no, the seating arrangement mattered. I remember one time catching wind of what she was trying to do. And, and listen, when I was getting a little older, like I couldn't be in the back anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like I had long legs. I needed some leg room. You know what I'm saying? And, and I remember I used to sit in the back with, with my brother Nicholas. And Nicholas is great, but he would sleep the entire road trip. The whole 25 hours or however long it was. It was lonely back there. And I was like, listen, my sister was trying to negotiate and manipulate the seating arrangement. I love, oh my goodness, the dynamics of this passage that we read. Because on display is a, an attempt of negotiating or even manipulating a seating arrangement in heaven. The sons of Zebedee, their mom comes before Jesus. I, I love this. The sons of Zebedee, they were Jesus' cousins. So their mom would have been his aunt. Any of you have that one aunt, that auntie, or that one family member that sometimes can micromanage? She brings her two sons before Jesus, and she, she, she comes before Jesus, and she's like, Jesus, I've got a favor. She asks her boys to kneel. And I can just imagine Jesus, you know, probably already knowing what's going on. And he's like, what is it, auntie? And she starts to ask about the seating arrangements in heaven. Now, some, some context to this passage is that there's been this, this competition brewing with the disciples. Jesus had been doing ministry for a couple of years, and he's called these disciples to follow him. And they've become available. They've started following after him. And, and they start to kind of formulate Jesus kind of has his, his kind of closest disciples Peter, James, and John, and I can't imagine what it would have been like to be one of the other disciples that's like not in the inner circle, like, you know what I'm saying? And there's this, there's comparison that's breaking out, and in chapter 17 of Matthew, they, there's this moment of the transfiguration where Jesus, he, he brings his closest disciples up with him on the mountaintop, and they get to see Moses, and they get to see Elijah, they get to hear the voice of God. It's this beautiful moment, but only three were invited. And then in Matthew 18, the disciples just come right out and ask Jesus. They say, Jesus, who is the most important among the kingdom of heaven? They're, they're, they're desiring, who's the most important? Who's your closest? Who's, who's going to be the greatest? Who's the greatest? And in Matthew 18 and 19, Jesus, he starts to tell some stories and he starts to do some things. There's a moment where the, the kids are trying to come to Jesus and the disciples are holding the kids back. And he's like, no, bring the kids to me because they are important in the kingdom of heaven. 
The kingdom of heaven belongs to these kids. Jesus, in, in Matthew 19, at the very end, the very last thing he said in that chapter was, the first will be last and the last will be first. So Jesus is trying to show his disciples. They don't think he knows what's going on, but he's trying to show them. He knows the comparison. He knows the controversy. He's trying to show his disciples, listen, wealth, accolades, importance, none of the things that you think are important in this world are actually important in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was trying to show them, I've got a better way I have a, my ways are higher my ways are different if you want to be important there's something different and it comes to a head in chapter 20 I can just imagine Jesus maybe a little bit agitated a little bit frustrated a little bit annoyed and his auntie comes and he just pulls his disciples together and he's like listen if you want to be great you need to serve if you want to be great, you need to serve. I want to encourage you this morning, church. God has greatness on your life. Yes, that's right. I don't care who you are, what your name is, or what your background is. God has greatness on your life. Not just a material greatness for this world. God has an eternal greatness. Your life has purpose. God has a grand plan. I, I get to serve as our youth pastor here at our church, and I feel like I'm a broken record because I say this all the time to our young people. God has a plan for your life, and it doesn't change when you're an adult. God has a plan for your life. God has greatness on every single person in this room, but there's a problem with our human condition that it takes the beautiful thing that God has created and when the human condition and our sinful nature kicks in, it starts to take the beautiful things that God has put inside of us, starts to distort, to corrupt, and it turns something beautiful into something ugly and horrific. There should be a beautiful desire in all of us to say, I want to be great for the kingdom of God. But what can so easily happen, especially in our culture and our society today, is that a lot of times our desire for greatness can turn into selfish ambition. It can turn into striving, into clamoring. It can turn into pushing ourselves forward for promotion. It can turn into climbing the ladder at all costs, no matter who you hurt in the process. Greatness, a lot of times we can start to clamor or grasp at greatness. I love what Jesus says to his two disciples and to their mom, to his aunt, when they ask about this position in heaven, this position of importance or greatness. He says, you don't even know what it is that you're asking. You don't even know. How many times when it comes to greatness or importance or significance, it's an always moving goalpost. A lot of times if we try to position our life to go after being great or being important, it's never actually enough. Well, what is greatness? Well, what is significance? Is it a dollar amount at the side of our paycheck? Is it the size of our home? Is it the legacy that we leave behind? Is it the car we drive? What is greatness? Well, Jesus clarifies all of this. And he says, do you want to be great? Then you need to serve. Do you want to be significant in the kingdom of heaven? Then you need to serve. Jesus shows his disciples and his followers and for us today reading the kingdom of heaven is not about titles and positions. It's about a posture. Posture of serving. I love in the passion translation of this passage. Jesus closes out this portion. He says that greatness is reserved for those 
who serve. Man, I want to be a man that my life has greatness and significance. I want to be a person that goes after the things of God for my life. But as I read this passage, and the older I get and the longer I follow Jesus, the more I start to recognize that greatness in the kingdom of heaven might not look like greatness from our standards of our culture or our society, but it looks like serving the King of kings, the Lord of lords. God in flesh came, was born in a stable and not in a palace. He rode a donkey and not on a chariot. He took a crown of thorns and not a crown of gold or rubies. He was a carpenter, not a Pharisee. Jesus chose the pathway of humility, not weakness, but humility, meekness, strength under control. Jesus chose to serve. And he invites you and he invites me to come along the journey. And he says, if you want your life to matter, if you want to experience significance, start serving. Start taking on the posture of serving. I just, I've got two things I want to encourage us this morning, church, because I believe that God has greatness in this room. And even as I look out across our church today, I'm so grateful that we have a church that loves to serve. I love that about our church. But I want to encourage you today, maybe you're here in this room and you feel like your life, you, you're, there's more significance to it. And you're not feeling fulfilled by reaching the standards or the accolades or the marker points that are set by our society to tell you that you're great. And you're feeling that feeling this morning, I want to encourage you, maybe it's because there's room in your life for serving. Is this helping anybody this morning, church? Amen. Two things I want to encourage you in this morning as we look at the life of Jesus. And this is where we look. We look to the life of Jesus. Two things when it comes to the posture of serving, the posture of greatness. The first thing is I want to encourage you today to make yourself available. Tell someone next to you, say, I'm available. I'm available. Hands up if you're available. Hands open if you're available. Make yourself, I love doing that. There's like half the people who actually participate and half the other people are like, are we actually doing this? I can see you. <laughs> I love it. Make yourself available. I love Jesus. I love looking. He had a, a short three-year ministry on this earth. He lived for 33 years, but only three of his years was dedicated to ministry. And in those three years, I love watching how Jesus simply made himself available. He was on this divine mission of going to the cross. He had this divine purpose, but yet he still had time to just be available. He was never hurried and never rushed. He would lend himself to whoever came to him. He was available. I loved that about Jesus. And he invites his disciples to come along this journey with him to make themselves available to people and to humanity, to, to come alongside the, these disciples. I believe what Jesus was instilling in them in this passage was something that would carry them as they start to lead the greatest movement in human history, which is the church. They made themselves available to serve the kingdom of God, to serve the body of Jesus Christ, to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. They gave their lives to the mission of what God wanted to do on this earth. What a calling. They made themselves available. I love what Corey Ten Boone says. What she said, she said that if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. I'm going to say that again. If the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. What that means is if the devil can't corrupt your pathway, if he can't get you off God's purpose for your life, what he might try to do, which is just as effective, is get you busy doing everything insignificant so you have no time for the significant things that God has for you. There's been moments in my life and still today that I'm constantly wanting to assess, God, are there 
places or areas of my life that I'm busy, but it's not important. That I'm occupied, but I'm not available. Church, I want to encourage you this morning to assume the posture of availability. The greatest way I believe that you can make your impact on this earth, however long your life might be, the greatest impact you can make from an eternal standpoint, the kingdom of heaven, is to make yourself available in God's hands. I want to be surrendered. I want to be available. I want to be used. I want to be involved in the body of Christ. I, I, I want to be a tool in God's hand. I want to be something he can use. I want to be a conduit. I want to be I want to be something that God uses. God, use me. Availability is a posture that doesn't come with any strings attached, by the way. There's no agenda when you say, God, I'm available. There's no, God, if you do this, I'll do this. Or if you do that, then I'll do this. It's just, Lord, I want to be available. Use me, Jesus. Oh, church, I believe that God wants to breathe into this church, into our church, a posture of saying, God, whatever it is that you have for me, I'm available. Whatever it is. I had a, I had a friend of mine come to our church just a few uh, months ago, as actually last year, and he came to our team rally. And, and I love our team rally. And if you're new here to church, or maybe you don't yet serve on a team here at our church, our team rally is just a moment where all of the people who serve on a Sunday morning, we gather together, we pray, sometimes we worship, we take communion together. And it's like my favorite moment of Sundays, other than when people decide to follow Jesus. Like that's like my second favorite moment. I love this moment. And he came and he watched, and he's like, man, there's a lot of people serving at your church. I'm like, praise God there is. Because we want to structure a church, a movement of people, a movement of God's body that creates space for people to serve and make a difference. We, we like this saying here at our church that a great church is not built on the talents of a few, praise God, but on the availability or the sacrifice of many. I love our church, but maybe you're here in this room this morning and you have yet to make a decision to start to just to serve. Let me just tell you, there's no better place to start than in the body of Christ, to be a part of this movement. As I look out, I love to see all the different people who serve. I'm just, I just keep looking at my man Daniel over here. This guy, you've got a servant heart. I love, God's gonna open so many doors for you, Daniel Lusk. He's going to do so many incredible things because you are always serving. I, I, God loves those who are available. It says, Lord, whatever you want to do, let it be done in me. I'm available. I'm available. I'm available. No strings attached. I'm available. God, I'm available. We have a growth walk. Joseph mentioned it earlier. Growth walk is an opportunity Maybe if you're new here to church or maybe you've been coming, but you don't yet serve in an area of church. And, and again, this isn't about, we, we've got amazing volunteers. We don't, it's not about us getting more people serving. It's about you making your biggest impact. And I believe you can do that when you start to serve. Come on. Come to Growth Walk. Let's see how you can serve and make an impact in this world through the local church. Man, I want to be a person that's available. Amen. Amen. The second thought I have this morning when it comes to the posture of serving, the posture, I'll just even say it's the posture of greatness. First one is to make yourself available. Second one is to make others valuable. Turn to that person you already turned to and say, you're valuable. Come on now, you're valuable. You are valuable. I love in this passage with Jesus he starts to pull his disciples together and, and, and they're bickering and they're arguing and they're upset at James and John, uh, James and, and they're, they're, they're upset because of their asking to be next to Jesus in heaven and they're just like frustrated and Jesus is probably a little bit like, God, give me patience, Lord. And he comes and he's like, listen, the rulers of this world, they rule over with an authority and they're authoritative, but that is not how it is with you. In other words, there's no 
There's no, here's us, here's everyone else. There's no uh, ladder. There's no structure of importance. He says, that's not how it is with you. If anything, he says, the Son of Man came to serve and not be served. Jesus was talking about himself. My very purpose is to serve, is to value other people. It's not about what other people can do for me. It's about what I can do for other people. I love, I love my dad. He, he's, been, he's our lead pastor. This week is his birthday, and our family, we kind of joke uh, on him a little bit because it's kind of a little family joke, but he loves the word cherish. <laughs> and uh, I don't, there's not many of my family members in the room today, but if there were, they'd be laughing because he just, he loves that word. And, and, uh, and he's always like, man, I just cherish that person. I, I, I cherish that. We'll be talking about somebody here in our church. He's like, man, I just cherish them. And we kind of giggle a little bit, but it, it, it's a part of who he is. He loves to value people. And it's funny to us, but he has set this precedent in our church. We're a church that values people. Because Jesus valued people. We will value people. You know that greatness comes with the realization of adding value to others. Instead of being trapped in the mindset that others are going to value us. Greatness comes... Listen, church, greatness comes with the realization that my life can add value to other people instead of being trapped in the mindset that other people need to add value to me. How many times can we navigate through life and all we're thinking is, how can this relationship value me? How can this person add to my life? How many times do we cut someone out of our life because they're no longer adding value to us? Value, I want to be a man that looks at the people around me as opportunity to add value to them. I want to be a person that says, Lord, uh, how can my life be a platform for those who are around me? How can my words speak life and destiny over those around me? How can my actions serve and add value to those who are in my world? Church, God has called us to add value to other people. Well, what if our church, what if our church would change our city because we just want to add value to it? What if we had a completely different perspective of not being trapped in things have got to serve me, but how can I serve others? How can I add value? Let me just encourage you this morning, if you're here in this room and you are an older generation, let me just encourage you, our next generation is desperate for you to add value to them. They need your insight. They need your wisdom. They need your encouragement. They need your discipleship. They need your investment in their life. They need your correction. They need your guidance. They need you to come around them. You have value to add to the next generation. And young people in this room today, maybe you're a young person, middle school or high school or a college student or a young adult, and I love, I love that our church, we've got young people who serve. Can I get an amen? Shout out to all the young people. I see, just, I see Aiden, Law, Aiden Rothwell over here on the camera. Gracie Chapman back there. She's doing our media today. Shout out to our young people who are serving. Listen, young person in this room today, you have something of value to add to the kingdom of God. We need your insight. We need, we need you. You have value to add. Think of your life. How can I add value? I'll invite the team to come, and we're going to close here in just a moment. It's always like the sign. He's almost done. The team's coming up. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I love it. In John 13, Jesus, he's with his disciples. Is a famous passage of Scripture. They're at the Last Supper, and Jesus is making preparations to go to the cross. It was the same setting this morning we took communion where Jesus, he broke the bread and he passed the cup. 
is the same exact moment where Jesus, after they finished eating, he took off of his he took his robe off and he assumed the posture of the foot washer. The the lowest position in the house. Jesus, he gets down and he gets water and he starts to wash his disciples' feet. And you could preach a whole message on the beauty of this moment. It's one of my favorite moments of scripture because the the love of God is just shown in this moment, but I'm not going to get all into it, but I start crying. Can't do that. But Jesus, he assumes the posture of a servant. He lowers his posture. He lowers himself and he starts to add value to his disciples. It's his last farewell. It's his last moment. And when he finishes, he says, this is a picture of the full extent of my love for you, that I would get down and wash your feet. This was a moment of serving. He was about to go to a cross, but he felt compelled to get down and to serve and to show them, listen, my life, my whole purpose of living, the whole reason for coming was to lay my life down as a ransom. I came to serve and not be served. And he gives his disciples a commission to go and do the same. Church, we have a commission not to be on this highly positioned whatever it might be, whatever the title is or or whatever, fill in the blank. We have a mission to serve people and to add value to people as Jesus did. He went to a cross to demonstrate that his life was serving as a bridge, as a way for people to get to know God. His very purpose of coming and living was to serve as the ransom payment. In that moment, he was showing his disciples, this is how much you are valuable to me. I'm going to die on a cross for you. And he invites his disciples, go and do the same. I don't know what your story is this morning, church, but I do know that we share this commission to go and to serve, to go and to be used. Your greatness is on the other side of your servanthood. Your impact in this world is on the other side of your willingness to assume the posture to serve. What capacity, what area, what abilities have God, has God given you? How is he calling you to serve? I want to encourage you this morning to stop with the comparisons, to stop with the sizing up to other people. Stop looking at culture for the definition of success and greatness and importance to look at Jesus. And to say, Lord, I want to serve. I want to do things your way. Your ways are higher. Your ways are better. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning, church, as we get ready to close this service this morning? Amen. God is good. God is good. Would you just bow your heads for a moment and and close your eyes for a moment of privacy in this room this morning? Maybe you're here in this room and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. And even as I preached this morning, God was just showing you a revelation of who He is and the type of God that He is. That He's not lording over you with anger and judgment, but He loves you so much and He valued you so much that He literally sent His Son to die on a cross for a payment that you deserved. But he did it freely and willingly so that he could serve and make a way for you to have a relationship with God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, it says that Jesus who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we who didn't know righteousness might inherit the righteousness of God. Thank you, Jesus, that he traded places and he sacrificed himself. He made himself available so that we could have a relationship with God. 
And if you're here and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I wanna let you know good news is that today can be your day. All it takes is a decision to say, Lord, I wanna follow you. Lord, I'm tired of living my own way. I wanna turn, I wanna follow you. I want things to be different. I want to follow you. I want to take that free gift of salvation. I wanna become a follower. I wanna become a Christian. If that's you here in this room this morning with all heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just raise your hand for a moment? Just so I know who I'm gonna pray for. I wanna pray for you this morning. Anybody in this room? Yeah, I see the hand back there. Uh, that's awesome. Anybody else? Yeah, I see the hand in the back. That's awesome. Anybody else say, I, I want to follow Jesus. I wanna follow Jesus. Yeah, I see that hand. That's awesome. Come on. Another hand. I see that. That's awesome. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray for us this morning. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask our whole church to pray this prayer together. Maybe if you're watching online, you can pray this prayer where you are as well. If you made this decision, this prayer that we're about to pray, we're going to pray it together, but this prayer is for those who just raise their hands. If you just raise your hand, this moment, this prayer is significant and it's for you. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you made that decision, just real quickly, a couple of things. One is keep coming to church. Keep, keep getting involved in this body. Keep, keep growing in your faith. Second thing is I want to encourage you to tell somebody. We're going to have a prayer team down here in just a moment to pray for people. Come and talk to them and let them know, hey, I made that decision to follow Jesus today. And the third thing is, is we want to give you a Bible get the Bible, start reading it for yourself. This is the start of a beautiful journey. Can we pray this morning? Would everybody repeat this prayer after me? Say, Jesus, Jesus thank, you thank you for your greatness, for your greatness and, your goodness and your goodness and your humility, and your humility that you chose, that you chose to, to make yourself available for me. To make your Available to go to a cross for me. To go to a cross for me. Today. Today. I'm making a decision. I'm making a decision. To turn from the person that I've been. To turn from the person I've been. And to start following you. And to start following you. I'm confessing with my mouth. I'm confessing with my mouth. What I believe in my heart. What I believe in my heart. That you are the Lord of my life. That you are the Lord of my life. That you died for me. That you died for me. That you rose for me. That you rose for me. And so now. And so now. I'm following you. I'm following you. I'm not turning back. I'm not turning back. So take me, Jesus. Take me, Jesus. Use me, Jesus. Use me, Jesus. And we can all say, Amen. Amen.